Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, I am Dr. Medora Dias from Goa Medical College. I am going to be presenting the topic for today, General Anatomy of Bone. Some of the clinical aspects of bone, rickets, a disease which attacks children in their younger ages, fractures of bone which could occur at any age group, bone marrow biopsy, a procedure done in order to do bone marrow examination, and kyphosis of the spine in osteoporosis. What is bone? All of us know what bone is. When we think of bone, we think of calcium. Bone is the structural framework of our body. Os in Latin and osteon in Greek are the names from which osteoid or bone is derived. It's a calcified living connective tissue it forms majority of the skeleton. It's one third of connective tissue impregnated with two thirds of calcium salts. It has an inorganic element made up of calcium phosphate and carbonate, which makes bone hard and rigid and withstand compressive forces. It's made up of an organic part of collagen fibers, which makes bone tough and flexible. If the organic component of bone is removed by putting bone in a chelating agent like EDTA, the bone can become flexible. On the other hand, if the calcium component of bone is removed, bone becomes brittle and breaks easily. What are the functions of bone? It gives shape and support to the body to which muscles are attached and provides a surface for these muscles to be attached and acts as levers for muscular action. Protects the vital organs, for example, the skull. The skull protects the brain. Within the cranium of the skull, we have the brain. And so the skull bones are performing a vital function of protecting the inner vital brain. Bone also harbors bone marrow within it. It's a reservoir for 97% calcium and phosphorus. It has the reticular endothelial cells for immunity and also contains paranasal air sinuses, which add timber to voice. Divisions of the skeletal system. We could broadly classify, if we look at the entire skeleton here, that's a total of 206 bones. We can classify the skeleton into an axial skeleton and an appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton is in the axis of the body, made up of the skull, the cranium and facial bones, the vertebral column, sacrum and coccyx. It also includes the thoracic cage and the sternum along with it. If we talk about the appendicular skeleton, the appendages are the limbs. So these are bones which connect the limbs and connect it to the trunk. So the pectoral or the shoulder girdle with the upper limb bones and the pelvic girdle with the lower limb bones. All these make a total collection of 206 bones. How do we classify bones? We start classification of bones according to their shape. According to their shape, they can be classified as long bones, short bones, flat bones, there are pneumatic bones, there are sesamoid bones and many other types. Let's start with long bones. When we say a long bone, we think of a shaft 
and two expanded ends. So, according to shape, so there are long bones having a shaft called the diaphysis and two expanded ends called the epiphysis. This is a typical long bone. This is the femur of the thigh. It has a shaft in the middle, an upper end and a lower end. This is the diaphysis, the epiphysis above and an epiphysis below. Within the shaft, there is a medullary cavity. So this is a typical long bone. Miniature short long bones are examples the metatarsals and the phalanges of the foot. They are bones having a shaft, a diaphysis, but only one epiphysis. Miniature long bones or short long bones also have a diaphysis, but only one epiphysis. The examples are the metacarpals and the phalanges in the hand and the metatarsals and the phalanges of the foot. Short bones the talus and calcaneus of the foot are short bones. They do not have a shaft. They just have cube-like shapes and articular surfaces. A modified long bone. This is the clavicle, also called the collar bone. It's a modified long bone. It has a shaft and two ends. But it has no medullary cavity. And that is why it's called a modified long bone. It is also the only bone in the body that lies horizontally placed. Only long bone horizontally placed. These are short bones, the calcaneus and the talus in the foot. They have no medullary cavity and no shaft. They are cube shaped bones with six surfaces. This is a flat bone as you can see it is thin and flat. It is called the scapula or the shoulder blade and it is very thin that is why it is called a flat bone. This is an irregular bone basically a bone that has irregular features. It has no shaft, no medullary cavity. The example is the hip bone of the pelvic girdle. Pneumatic bones, pneuma means air. These are bones of the skull which have air cavities in them and they are called pneumatic bones. If you look at the maxilla, can you see this small little air cavity within it? The function of these air cavities in these bones is to lighten the weight of the skull and add resonance and timber to the voice. This is a sesamoid bone, the example being the patella, also called the kneecap, lying in the tendon of quadriceps femoris anterior to the knee joint. It is a bone that develops inside a tendon, has no periosteum. Sesamoid bones like the patella are called so because they resemble sesame seeds. They are found in tendons or in joint capsules. They have no periosteum. Examples are the patella in quadriceps femoris, fabella in the head of the left gastrocnemius or rider's bone in the tendon of a ductor longus. The functions of sesamoid bones, they resist pressure, they minimize friction, they alter the direction of pull of a muscle and they maintain local circulation. Here you can see this is the knee joint from a sectional view, the femur, the tibia and you can see the patella here. It lies enclosed in the tendon of the quadriceps femoris muscle. The patella here again showing you the attachments of the different muscles on its surface. Also classified according to shape are accessory bones also called supernumerary bones like the wormian bones of the skull. Since they lie between sutures of the skull, they are also called sutural bones and they are most commonly found in the lambdoid suture. Additional bones also include the cervical rib, wherein part of the cervical vertebra becomes a rib, or the lumbar rib, 
where a part of the lumbar vertebra becomes a rib. Other examples are os tibial, externum, accessory navicular, os trigonum or accessory talus. So we have completed one way of classifying bone based on shape. We proceed to a developmental classification where bones can be classified according to how they develop. Do they develop in membrane or do they develop as a preformed cartilage model? So we have membrane or dermal bones. These ossify in membrane from mesenchymal condensations like bones of the skull and bones of the face. These develop as membranous ossification and they are called dermal bones. Cartilaginous bones, these ossify in cartilage. They are preformed cartilage models in which ossification starts. For example, bones of the limbs, bones of the vertebral column and the thoracic cage. They all have a cartilaginous type of development. Then there are bones that have a combination of membranous as well as cartilaginous. So they ossify partly in membrane and partly in cartilage like the clavicle and the mandible. Developmentally, you could also classify bones as somatic bones or visceral bones. Somatic bones are most of the bones in the body, whereas visceral bones are the bones which develop from the branchial arches. Like, if you look in this figure, the mandible, the ear ossicles, the malleus, the incus and the stapes, as well as the hyoid bone. All these bones develop from the branchial arches and so these are called visceral bones. You could also classify bones based on a regional classification like I already showed you, appendicular and axial. So if you see here, I explained to you already, axial bones along the middle axis of the body, it also includes the thoracic cage. Appendicular bones for the limbs, upper limb, lower limb, along with the shoulder girdle and the hip girdle. Another classification of bones is a structural classification. So this is the third manner in which you could classify bones. This could be macroscopic or microscopic. Let's go to the macroscopic structural classification. Macroscopically, it depends on the architecture of bone. Is it compact or is it cancellous? When we say compact, what do you think? You think of something tightly packed leaving no spaces within it. When we say cancellous, it's got spaces within it. So that's the basic difference between compact bone and cancellous bone. If you look here in this figure, this bone has been sectioned to show you the compact bone, like a shell, very compact, no spaces in it. And you can see in the epiphyseal end, there is bone with lot of spaces in it. This is cancellous bone. Since it has spaces, it's also called spongy bone or trabecular bone. It has an open texture and you can see meshwork or trabeculae. Trabeculae could be of three types. A meshwork of rods, rods and plates or just of plates. Just a short table to differentiate compact bone from cancellous or spongy bone. Compact bone is seen in the diaphysis of a long bone. Spongy bone is seen in the epiphysis. The lamellae in compact bone form a good arrangement called the haversian system. Whereas in spongy bo bone, there is no haversian system. In compact bone, the bone marrow is yellow whereas in spongy bone it is red and produces RBCs, WBCs and platelets. 
The nature of compact bone is hard and ivory like whereas spongy bone is of course spongy. There is a law in bones called the Wolf's law which talks about bone formation in response to stresses and strains. There's two types of lamellae, pressure lamellae and tension lamellae. Pressure lamellae are these lines that you see. These pressure lamellae are parallel to the line of weight transmission in a bone. Whereas tension lamellae are arranged at right angles to the pressure lamellae. This is the upper end of femur where these lamellae are very distinctly seen and they are called the calcal femoral. So when you see calcar femoral on an x-ray of the femur, this is due to the lines of stress and lines of compressive forces. If you take the structural microscopic classification, bone is divided into five types. Lamellar bone, seen in adult, mature bones, woven bone, seen in fetal bones, or new formed fractured repaired bones, fibrous found in young fetal bones mostly seen in lower animals, dentin found in teeth and cement also found in teeth. This is a picture of lamellar bone. You can see the haversian systems, a haversian canal around which there are lamellae of bone deposits called haversian systems. This is typical of lamellar bone. To summarize, bone is a calcified living connective tissue made up of connective tissue and calcium salts. The functions of bone we have just gone through, levers for the muscles, supports the body, protects internal organs to name a few. Classification of bones according to shape, we have studied about long, short, flat, irregular, pneumatic, sesamoid and accessory bones. Developmentally, we have said membranous ossification, cartilaginous ossification or a combination membrano-cartilaginous or we have also divided them into somatic bones or visceral bones. There is a regional classification as axial and appendicular. A structural classification which could be macroscopic, compact and cancellous or microscopic, lamellar, woven, fibrous, dentin and cement. What is the gross structure of adult long bone? If we take a long bone, the femur again, there is an outer cortex. I told you there is a medullary cavity inside. And the cortex is covered by a layer of fibrous tissue called the periosteum. The periosteum does not cover the articular surface. It has an outer fibrous layer, an inner osteogenic layer and it is connected by Sharpie's fibers. The cortex is the outer bony compact shell which gives strength to the bone. The medullary cavity is lined by endosteum and it helps in bone repair and remodeling of bone. The medullary cavity has red bone marrow which is later replaced by yellow fatty marrow. But there are some sites in the body where you do get red bone marrow. In this figure you can see the skeleton, the bones which show you sites in the adult where you still have red bone marrow production. The iliac crest, upper ends of femur, lower ends of femur, upper ends of tibia, around the elbow joint region and wrist joint and the sternum. The sternum and the iliac crest, these are two sites of choice of doing a bone marrow biopsy. A bone marrow biopsy can be done by puncturing the sternum or the iliac crest with a special syringe and withdrawing 
a few cells of the bone marrow for examination. What are the parts of a young growing bone? Every bone has got a diaphysis, the shaft, and epiphysis at either end. In addition to that, if you look in this figure, there is an epiphysis, a diaphysis, and an epiphysis below. The junction of the epiphysis with the diaphysis is called the metaphysis. And at the metaphysis, there is a plate of cartilage called the epiphyseal plate. This plate is called the growth plate of cartilage and it is at this site that growth of the bone in length can take place. Parts of a young growing bone. The epiphysis is the end of a long bone which could develop by different ways. Types of epiphysis are divided into pressure epiphysis, traction epiphysis and atavistic epiphysis. Let's look at details with examples of these three types of epiphysis. Pressure epiphysis, usually articular and takes part in weight transmission like the humeral head. So the one that you see here, the head of humerus in blue, this is a pressure epiphysis. What is a traction epiphysis? Traction means pull. So the traction epiphysis is non-articular, it has no weight transmission, it provides attachment to tendons which exert a pull on it, the humeral tubercles and the femur trochanters. So here we see in green the greater tubercle of humerus which is a traction epiphysis. The third type is called the atavistic epiphysis is actually an independent bone in lower animals whereas in man it gets fused to another bone for example the coracoid process of the scapula. There is another type called the aberrant epiphysis is not always present like the epiphysis on the head of first metacarpal or the basis of the other metacarpal bones. Next we come to the diaphysis. The diaphysis is the part of the bone which forms the shaft. It ossifies from a primary center of ossification. What is the metaphysis? The metaphysis is the epiphyseal ends of the diaphysis. It's the zone of active growth in a bone. It's called a lake of blood because it is highly vascular. Before epiphyseal fusion, if you look at the nutrient artery, it branches and goes upwards and then turns sharply here to give hepin bend vessels. And because of this, the metaphyseal ends of bone are prone to osteomyelitis. In whom? In children. Now, in children, the growth plate of cartilage still exists, whereas in adults, the growth plate of cartilage will disappear once the epiphysis fuses to the diaphysis. So, osteomyelitis due to hairpin bend vessels in the metaphysis is an occurrence only in a younger age group, basically in children. Bacteria get trapped in these hairpin bends causing this osteomyelitis. The epiphyseal growth plate of cartilage is between the epiphysis and the metaphysis and this is the site at which growth in length of a long bone takes place. Now, if a long bone needs to grow, if any bone needs to grow, it needs blood supply. It's very important to understand what is the blood supply to a long bone. A young bone will have the main nutrient artery, a periosteal set of arteries, the epiphyseal and the metaphyseal. If you look in this figure here, this is the nutrient artery which enters the nutrient foramen of the bone and branches upwards and downwards. The metaphyseal arteries could be seen here at the metaphysis and these are the epiphyseal arteries. The periosteal vessels are many in number 
and they also supply the most superficial regions of bone. In a young bone, where the epiphyseal plate is still present, there is no communication between the epiphyseal arteries and the remaining blood vessels. But when the epiphyseal plate of cartilage disappears, when the bones get fused between the diaphysis and epiphysis, then there is a communication between the blood vessels of the nutrient artery, metaphyseal and epiphyseal arteries as well. To study the direction of the nutrient foramen and the nutrient vessels supplying bone, there is an easy mnemonic to remember. Towards the elbow I go, away from the knee I flee. What does this mean? So if you look at the direction of the nutrient foramen, it is towards the elbow or away from the knee. Why? Because the growing ends of bones are in the shoulder region and wrist and around the knee. So if these are the growing ends of the bone, due to the growth, the vessel gets pulled and there's traction leading to a change in the orientation of the nutrient foramen. Periosteal arteries are numerous below the periosteum. They supply the outer one third of the cortex. Epiphyseal arteries are derived from the periarticular arcades of vessels. Metaphyseal arteries are derived from neighboring vessels. All this time we were studying the blood supply of a long bone. Let's proceed now to blood supply to other types of bones like the short bones. The long short bones have a nutrient artery in the middle of their shaft. Short bones have got vessels, numerous vessels from the periosteal side which enter their non-articular surfaces. Vertebrae, you can see here in this figure, this is the blood supply of a vertebra. There are posterior vessels for the body, anterior vessels and large lateral vessels which also supply the laminae and spines. A rib will also have a nutrient artery as well as periosteal arteries. Remember that blood supply to a bone is always very rich because bone always has active growth and active remodeling throughout life. Putting a medullary pin into the medullary cavity in a fractured bone does not interfere in any way with the blood supply to a bone because you have seen the amount of blood supply to a bone and the various vessels which contribute to this blood supply. The venous drainage. Veins are large in cancellous bones. In compact bones, they accompany the arteries. Lymphatics have not been demonstrated in bone, though they say that some lymphatics do accompany periosteal blood vessels. Nerve supply to a bone. Nerves accompany the vessels in a bone, mostly sympathetic, and there are few nerves which are sensory to the articular ends. Remember that periosteum is very sensitive and has a good nerve supply. So sensitive, you can take for example, if someone kicks you on your shin, is it painful or not? Yes, it's very painful. That's because there is a collection of blood under the periosteum and this becomes a very painful nature because of the excessive nerve supply and the sensitivity of the periosteum. To summarize, the gross structure of the adult long bone, we studied that it has a shaft, the periosteum, a cortex, a medullary cavity and two ends. What are the parts of a growing young bone? The epiphysis, the diaphysis, the metaphysis and the epiphyseal plates. The epiphysis could be of a pressure type, a traction type, atavistic or aberrant. Blood supply to bones through a nutrient artery, periosteal arteries, epiphyseal arteries and metaphyseal arteries. 
There is venous drainage. They accompany the arteries and drain to the respective veins. Lymphatics have not been demonstrated but do drain the periosteum. Nerve supply, I have told you, very rich in the periosteum. Let's study the ossification of bones. Bones ossify by two methods of ossification, membranous or mesenchymal ossification and endochondral ossification. The primary center of ossification, if you look in this figure, this is a cartilaginous model of a bone. In the center of that bone appears a primary center of ossification and there is a vessel getting in to supply this growing bone. This happens around the 8th week of intrauterine life. The secondary centers of ossification arise at either end of the bone after birth except in the lower end of femur and the upper end of tibia where they appear in the ninth month of intrauterine life. The primary center forms the diaphysis whereas the secondary centers form the epiphysis. Fusion of the epiphysis with the diaphysis starts at puberty and completes by 25 years of age. After this, no more growth in length of the bones can take place. There is a law of ossification that we always have to remember. The law of ossification states that the secondary center that appears first is the last to fuse. The exception to this rule is the lower end of fibula where the secondary center that appears first fuses first. What is the concept of the growing end of a bone? The end of the bone where the epiphysis and diaphysis fusion occurs later is called the growing end of a long bone. What is growth of a bone? Now during life up to the age of 25 years before the fusion of epiphysis and diaphysis take place, the bone can grow in length. Bone can also grow in breadth and thickness. If you look here, bone has grown in length. Bone grows in length by a multiplication of cells at the epiphyseal growth plate. Bone can also grow in thickness by a multiplication of cells deeper in the periosteum. There is appositional growth also called surface accretion like bones of the skull. Layers of bone get deposited on the outer aspect whereas layers of bone get removed from the inner aspect keeping the thickness of the skull bones the same. This is remodeling. What are the factors affecting growth of a long bone? When we think about children who are growing, their bodies are actively growing, their bones are active, actively growing. Children need good nutrition supplements. Why? Because their body is actively growing. Bones need vitamins, nutrients, a lot of nourishment in order to grow in a proper manner. So adequate amounts of proteins, carbohydrates, minerals, Vitamins and hormones are needed for bones to grow properly. Vitamins like vitamin A, there is vitamin D and vitamin C which is also required for bone growth. Hormones like growth hormone from the pituitary gland, parathormone from the parathyroid and calcitonin from the thyroid are also hormones required for proper growth of bones. What are the medical legal and anthropological aspects of bones? Now sometimes you hear of stories wherein remains of bones were found buried somewhere or thrown away somewhere and people are trying to find out the identity of the person from these bone remains. 
So that means bones do have a medical legal importance and anthropological importance as well. When a skeleton or any isolated bones are found for medical legal examination, a person, especially a medical person, should be able to determine the following. Are the bones human or not? Whether they belong to one or more persons? What is the age, the sex and the stature of the individual to whom the bones belong? And most importantly, what is the time and the cause of death? Estimation of skeletal age. Up to the age of 25 years, skeletal age can be estimated within 1 to 2 years of the actual correct age by looking at the dentition and ossification. But this is if the entire skeleton is available. After 25 years, skeletal age can be estimated with plus or minus 5 years of the correct age by looking at cranial sutures or bony surfaces of the symphysis pubis. Appearance of secondary centers and fusion of epiphysis, remember, always occurs a year earlier in females than in males. Estimation of sex. Gender can be determined after the age of puberty and these evidences are best seen in the pelvis and the skull. Accurate determination of gender can be done in over 90% of cases with either pelvis or skull alone. Now I am holding up for you two skulls, two human skulls. So skull number one, skull number two. If you look at them carefully, you will be able to see some differences between them. For example, I feel this skull is a lot lighter, whereas this one is a lot heavier. That's the male skull, skull number one, whereas this one, which I'm holding in my right hand, is skull number two, the female skull. The features are more defined in a male skull and the skull bones are smoother in a female skull. See the size of the facial skeleton, the size of the bones is also less in a female skull. By examining various other features of the skull, you could determine the difference between male or female. The pelvis of a human body also shows differences between male and female. The male pelvis is narrower whereas a female pelvis is wider. Besides this, there are many other differences that go to differentiate between male and female just by looking at the pelvic bones. Estimation of race. This can be done by using a number of metrical and non-metrical features of the skull, the pelvis and other bones which have racial significance. Estimation of stature or height can also be done by examining bones and looking at characteristic ratios and comparison, comparison with total height. There are formulae to determine height from limb bones. Crown rump length is another formula which can tell you the length of a fetus and correlate it with the diaphyseal length of fetal bones. To summarize, we have spoken about development and ossification of bones by two methods, a membranous type and an endochondral type of ossification. We spoke about growth of a long bone, growth in length, growth in thickness, appositional growth or remodeling of bone. Factors affecting bone growth will include carbohydrates, proteins, minerals, vitamins and hormonal balances. We have also covered medical legal and anthropological aspects of the importance of bones, estimation of skeletal age, sex, stature, race as well as the time and cause of death. Let's now talk about the clinical anatomy of bones, various anomalies and diseases that affect bones in our body. 
Cledocranial dysostosis. Here there is a defect in membranous ossification. It could be genetic or environmental and it shows three features. The first affects the clavicles leading to aplasia or non-development. The second affects the cranium leading to an increase in the transverse diameter. The third is a fontanel ossification that gets delayed. Coming to achondroplasia, you may have heard of it. There is a defect in the endochondral ossification leading to shortening or dwarfism. Limbs are short but the trunk is normal. It is normally a dominant genetic trait. Fractures of bone. Now this is what everyone is always worried about. I am scared I am going to break my bones. What is a fracture? A break in the continuity of bone. There are different types of fractures. A fracture could be a simple crack wherein it is called a hairline fracture or it could be a large compound fracture with a skin wound sometimes with a bony protrusion through the skin wound. Here we have classified fractures. A simple fracture could be classified into spiral, horizontal or oblique. Spiral, horizontal or oblique, this depends on how the bone breaks. But remember, notice here that the skin shows no wound. If you look at this picture here, this is a compound fracture where the bone has not only broken into two separate pieces, but the skin has also been opened. This is an open type of compound fracture. It is more complicated because it gets infected. Compound fractures and even sometimes simple fractures have to go under a reduction treatment. Alignment of the broken ends is done and the bone is fixed. Here you see this picture of fractured second cervical vertebra, the dense fractures of. It is a type of fracture found in hanging and so it is called hangman's fracture. The dense separates out from the body and this dense compresses the spinal cord and the medulla leading to instantaneous death. Why are fractures important? Besides having a fracture open or closed, you also have to worry about what can that fractured bony edge damage. Always remember nerves and arteries are very closely related to bones and so when there are fractures of bones, the nerves and arteries could get damaged and injured. If a nerve gets damaged, it is going to function less or maybe not at all and the muscle it supplies is going to be paralyzed. If an artery gets damaged, it is going to lead to a lot of blood loss and this needs to be treated surgically. Rickets. Rickets is a deficiency of vitamin D. Calcification of cartilage fails to occur. Ossification of the growing ends of bone is affected. This presents between 3 months to 3 years. So I think if we remember the digit 3, we will remember when rickets affects persons between the age of 3 months to 3 years. This is when most of the growth takes place. So osteoid or bony tissue is being formed but it is not being mineralized. You get something called the rachitic rosary along the chest and deformities of the epiphyseal ends which get enlarged. There is bowing of the legs. All this at the costochondral junctions. You see the Harrison sulcus at the diaphragmatic attachment. Scurvy. Scurvy is a deficiency of vitamin C. So the collagenous fiber formation and matrix is defective and the intercellular cementing substances are defective. Leading to ruptured capillaries, defective formation of new vessels, hematomas in the muscles and bones, severe pain and tenderness, the normal architecture at the growing end of bone is lost. Spina bifida. 
You see in this figure here, this is the normal vertebral column with the vertebral spines and this is the vertebral canal where would lie the spinal cord. In a spina bifida, the laminae of the vertebrae do not fuse posteriorly leading to a defect. This spina bifida could be classified into various types. This is a vertebra belonging to the vertebral column. It has a body and two laminae that go posteriorly to form the spine. In spina bifida, the two laminae have failed to fuse to form the spine, resulting in a defect through which the spinal cord is not enclosed by bone posteriorly. Spina bifida could be divided into different types depending on the grade. There is spina bifida occulta, meningocele, meningomyelocele and syringocele. Spina bifida occulta we can see here is clinically characterized by a tuft of hair at the base of the spine. The laminae fail to fuse posteriorly and the spinal cord is covered just by skin and there is a tuft of hair at that site. The next type is called the meningocele. In a meningocele, there is bony defect and the meninges bulge out of the defect covered by skin. There is no defect in the spinal cord. In meningomyelocele, the spinal cord also lies in the bulging meninges. The last type is a syringocele where the central canal of the spinal cord is also enlarged. Osteomalacia. Osteomalacia is due to a deficiency of calcium and vitamin D in adult life, whereas osteoporosis is due to deficiency of calcium in old age. The vertebral bodies collapse leading to forward bending of the person. The vertebral column bends forwards because of collapse of these vertebral bodies. The person is also predisposed to fractures of the femoral neck, the vertebrae and the wrist. Always remember because of hormonal imbalances postmenopausally, these women are more affected by osteoporosis. Bone marrow biopsy or transplant. Now, you must have heard of cases of leukemia. How are these cases diagnosed? You are basically doing a bone marrow biopsy to decide whether the bone marrow is functioning well or not. How do we do this bone marrow biopsy and what are the sites for doing it? Bone marrow biopsy can be done either from the iliac crest or the manubrium sternum by a special syringe and bone marrow transplant can also be done at the same site. So you can harvest non-malignant cells from a good patient's bone marrow and put it into the diseased person's marrow area. This is called bone marrow transplantation. Bone tumors, bone is susceptible to benign or malignant tumors. If you see in this figure here, that's a huge bone tumor, an osteosarcoma probably in the lower end of the neck of femur. Let's summarize what we have studied today. Bone, we said it's a calcified living connective tissue. We have classified bones based on their shape, development, their region and structure. We talked about the gross structure of the adult bone having a shaft with two ends. The parts of a young growing bone, the epiphysis, the diaphysis, a metaphysis and the epiphyseal plates. Blood supply of bones, we said there is a nutrient artery, periosteal arteries, epiphyseal arteries and metaphyseal arteries. Development in ossification, we said two types, membranous or mesenchymal and endocondyl ossification. We also spoke about how a long bone grows in length, in thickness, in apposition and remodeling of bone. Factors affecting bone growth, all nutritive elements, 
intake of proteins, carbohydrates, minerals, vitamins and hormones. We also talked about the medico legal aspects of bones, how to estimate skeletal age or sex or stature, race as well as the cause and time of death. Clinical anatomy, we have seen different diseases affecting bones like rickets, cleidocranial dysostosis, achondroplasia, fractures, spina bifida, osteomalacia, osteoporosis, bone marrow biopsy, transplant as well as bone tumors. With this we end our topic for today. Thank you.